up next on Twill, we have privacy gurus Mark Rotenberg and Ryan Kahlo to talk about privacy, robots, what's really public, where you have dinner, and all that and more coming up on Twill 67. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for This Week in Law is provided by Cashfly at C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com. This is Twill, This Week in Law with Denise Howell, Episode 67, Skynet Knows All. This Week in Law is brought to you by Hover.com. Hover is domain name registration and management that's simple. For 10% off your new domain, go to twill.hover.com. Hi, and welcome to This Week in Law. I'm Denise Howell, your host. And this is where we talk about the intersection, or sometimes the collision spot, of law and technology. We've got a great panel to do just that today, and uh, all about privacy issues, which I'm very excited to get into. We've got Epic's Mark Rotenberg, the Electronic Privacy Information Center in Washington, D.C. Mark is the president of that entity. Thanks so much for joining us, Mark. Hi, Denise. Hi, great to have you. Thanks so much for taking the time out of your very busy week, which we'll get to in a second. Um, also, we've got Ryan Callow from, am I saying that right, Ryan? Callow? Callow, Callow, Kalo. yeah. Kalo. Ryan Kalo from, uh, from the Stanford Center for Internet and Society and head of their consumer privacy project there. Uh, Ryan, great to have you on the show. Thanks for having me. Our pleasure. And also joining us is Evan Brown from Chicago at, from also the blog internetcases.com. Hi, Evan. Uh, good morning to you. Uh, thanks for having me. It's great to be here. Great to have you. Um, so we are talking about some really, really crucial issues here today uh, because we're increasingly living in a world where everything around us is electronically connected and harvesting data in one way or another. And as we go through our lives and have our various activities logged and tracked, um, the, we're not quite sure that the legal system that we have in place and the laws that we have in place are up to par with today's technological reality. Um, and to the extent that they are, we'd like to hash through that. And to the extent that, that we aren't, um, I'm really looking forward to getting Ryan and Mark's insights on that. And I'd like to start out with a question for you too, and we'll start with Mark, um, about something sort of abstract that touches on a lot of the stories that we'll get into more specifically today. And, and that question is whether you think there's a protectable privacy interest in information that is actually publicly available. That seems to be um, something that is a cornerstone of a lot of misunderstandings and tension these days. And I wonder what you think about that, Mark. Denise, it's a wonderful question. Um, it's the question that I begin my privacy law class with almost every year. I've been teaching this course for 20 years now. And um, it's the question I start with, because I think most people, when they think about privacy, they think, well, if information gets out there, how can we possibly restrict its use? Uh, but that's also where the right of privacy began. Uh, there was a famous article in the law review more than a century ago where the person who became Justice Brandeis said, people do have some right to control their information that's held by others, that's observable by others. And if we think about it for a moment, when you give information to a bank or to an ISP or, or even to a friend, um, there are expectations of privacy that are created. So just the fact that you may have disclosed information to someone else, um, I don't think that ends the discussion about privacy. I actually think that's where it begins. What do you think, Ryan? If something is, is publicly out there, it's a matter of public record or it's something that you've affirmatively placed in the public eye through use of something like a social network. Do you think that there's any protectable privacy interest that remains? I do, I do. I, I, I couldn't agree more with, uh, with Mark. Um, and I would add that uh, there are really a number of different ways that uh, changes in technology implicate privacy. Um, 
the first is through making it easier, more efficient to collect information. Um, but the others are making it easier to uh, process that information and disseminate it. Um, so once upon a time, you'd be walking down the street and maybe you would uh, you trip or have an embarrassing moment and only the people around you would see it. Um, take that same public moment and it's recorded and uploaded and saved and processed and collated. Um, and all of a sudden you have a very different set of harms that might, might happen. Um, so I, I think that really changes in, in technology um, have, have converted what would be a, a sort of transient public moment into one that is lasting and, and has deeper uh, meaning. Yeah, that's a really excellent point. Evan, do you think that there's a distinction when, uh, when things are actually out there publicly as opposed to something that you believe and maybe reasonably or unreasonably believe um, is something that is confidential? I like what Ryan said about how technology really has, has changed the, the landscape and the, the context for this all. There's this notion uh, what is it? Uh, I, I forget the exact uh, phrase or exact term that's that's used, but a, a certain sense of of obscurity that would arise from information that you know, for example, you would have to walk down to the courthouse and get and you know look through a dusty file and find mm -hmm. you know that that ostensibly was public information, but because it was so difficult to get to and so difficult to find, uh, it was for all practical purposes private, uh, even though though it was out there. So. Um, in that sense, uh, it, it really is based on how the, the norms have changed, which uh, are, are as a result of, of the ways that, that information can be more widely distributed and made available, even though nominally uh, the, the status of it has not changed between uh, private and, and non-private information. That's, that's an intriguing aspect of, of all of this to me. What I also think is intriguing and... and uh Professor Rotenberg, maybe you can uh, enlighten us as to what you and your classes discuss about this. Um, I, what the government's role is in all this, because that's, of course, how we wind up getting privacy laws and standard enfor standards enforced. Uh, traditionally, government has uh, had a privacy um, interest in making sure that the data about its citizens are, that it collects is kept confidential. Uh, but when you reach out and begin to encompass the world of third parties, services like search engines or social networks or advertising conglomerates or the medical field or the banking field, anything that uh, is a third party that also has critical information about citizens, um, it's, it's a blurrier line sometimes what it is appropriate for the government to step in and do. And Mark, I, I wonder, it, it, the analogy that springs to mind in the privacy sphere for me is uh, the abortion debate and, and the tension around whether uh, government can interfere in that private sphere that is not really something that the government is involved uh, necessarily in all cases in um, in providing. It's simply the court stepping in and saying, uh, well, even if this is purely a private third party transaction, we still feel there's a strong enough privacy interest here that the government must step in and um, have a say in this. So um, where is that line? Where does the government begin to interfere or, or set standards for third parties? Well, it's a really interesting question. And of course, sometimes when we're fighting for privacy, we're arguing against government surveillance. And other times when we're fighting for privacy, we're arguing for government enforcement of privacy laws. And people get a little bit confused and think maybe we're being schizophrenic about all this. But if you take a step back, I think what you really have to do is understand that there are different government actors that play different roles uh, depending on the privacy issue. Uh, so, for example, when we're concerned about surveillance, we're concerned about, you know, agents of the FBI or the NSA and whether they're uh, acting with proper legal authority when they conduct surveillance. And at the same time, we're trying to strengthen judges who are also part of the government and ensuring that they do the necessary oversight and counterbalance uh, for law enforcement activities. So I think when people, you know, talk about the relationship between government and privacy, there's a tendency to kind of let everything, uh, you know, blur together, as you say. 
Uh, but if you look a little bit more closely, I think it's easy to understand, in fact, how sometimes uh, government can be a threat to privacy and other times government is actually uh, critical uh, to help uh, protect privacy. And a couple of those instances where you know, we're used to standards and practices and regulation are um, the medical industries, the banking industries that have had data on people for generations um, and have very stringent standards under existing laws for how they can manage and treat that data. Um, industries that are not so traditionally regulated are things like search and social networking. Do you see a whole new host of policies and laws coming into play for this or is our existing frame, framework sufficient? Well, I think the answer is actually both. I mean, I think the general framework that we have for privacy protection is a good one, but I also think that it needs to be extended uh, to cover, as you say, new services, you know, Web 2.0 platforms and ISPs and basically any company that's collecting personal data, I think should have some privacy obligations uh, that are protected uh, in law. So a lot of times the challenge is not so much to uh, revise uh, privacy with new technologies, but rather to take the traditional principles and to apply them with new technology. In fact, that was a big theme this week uh, with the questioning of the Supreme Court nominee, uh, Alana Kagan. Uh, she was asked several times about constitutional interpretation in the Fourth Amendment, and her answer was that, you know, we apply these principles in new settings, but we don't change the principles. Isn't right. this some, a situation Sorry, where there... Well, this seems to be a situation where there almost has to be some kind of new legal development or new system or new perspective on all of this. Because if you compare, you know, the Web 2.0 environment, uh, you know, social media and the use of all that stuff, and you look at the way and the just the setup, if you will, of how information is is transferred, where it's stored, who wants to get a hold of it, how it, it should be shared or how it it wants to be shared or how the, the agents within the system want to share the information, that seems fundamentally different than the way that information is stored and kept and shared and guarded in the traditional, you know, so to speak, uh, modes here of, of healthcare and finance and all of that stuff. Do, isn't that such a fundamental distinction in the, the way that, that information is, is kept and shared and, and transferred that there really has to be a, a broad rethinking and, and we can't uh, hang too much, uh, hang our hat on the, on the old uh, old uh, system and, and, and modes too much? Could I answer that, Denise? Absolutely. Well, it's a great question. Um, and of course, it's the question that, you know, I was wrestling with, I, I don't want to say how long ago um, it was, but it was sometime before the World Wide Web. And we were trying to imagine how do you extend communication privacy laws uh, to email? And people said, wow, you know, email is completely different from letters and from telephone calls and, and we'll need to take a different approach. And there were some changes made that recognized that email was different from a telephone call. To begin with, you know, it's stored on a remote computer somewhere. Um, it exists physically a little bit like a letter, but also it moves around electronically like a telephone call. And we came up with an approach that tried to blend uh, both the traditional principles with the realities of the new technology. So I think um, I, I probably agree with, with much of what you're saying, uh, but it is an evolutionary process. And I think it's surprising sometimes actually how much we can take from some of the old laws and apply to these new settings. Um, so let's talk for a minute about the hearings that you've been uh, attending in Washington, Mark about uh, our potential new Supreme Court Justice, Ms. Kagan. Um, you have submitted a letter, EPIC has submitted a letter um, together with a number of other signatories um, asking that the committee holding the hearings this week delve into Ms. Kagan's privacy history, if you will, and ask her some pointed questions about um, specific issues that she might be called upon to uh, make rulings as a Supreme Court justice. And one, I read through the letter and there was one really interesting quote at the end that you pulled out from the confirmation hearings on Chief Justice John Roberts uh, that Senator Biden had said. And back then in 2005, um, he said to then potential new justice Roberts, 
we will be faced with equally consequential decisions in the 21st century. Can a microscopic tag be implanted in a person's body to track his every movement? There is actual discussion about that. You will rule on that, mark my words, before your tenure is over. Can brain scans be used to determine whether a person is inclined toward criminality or violent behavior? Uh, see Minority Report. <laughs> you will rule on that. So um, there, there are all kinds of fascinating issues that the Supreme Court might take up um, during the course of one's tenure there. And uh, I wonder how you think uh, these hearings are going and whether your letter has had an impact. Well, the hearings were very interesting. They just wrapped up uh, last night, in fact. The schedule uh, was, was squeezed a bit, partly, unfortunately, because of the passing of Senator Byrd last week. And there were services held um, yesterday here in Washington, and the uh, hearing was uh, really suspended during the time of the services. Uh, but it was a wonderful uh, uh, series of hearings. I think uh, Elena Kagan uh, presented herself very well. I mean, she's obviously a very accomplished, very smart, uh, very thoughtful person, and I think a good nominee. Uh, we did not hear the questions that we were hoping for with, with sort of the precision that we were looking for that we outlined in the letter. But something very interesting did happen at the beginning of the hearing. Almost the very first question that Chairman Leahy asked the Solicitor General about uh, concerned constitutional interpretation um, and the Fourth Amendment. And, uh, you know, she responded by saying that the framers of the Fourth Amendment were very wise to write in broad terms. In her words, you know, they did not live in a time of drug sniffing dogs and uh, heat sensing devices. And her comment was specifically about two important Supreme Court cases uh, applying the Fourth Amendment to new technology. So it was very much, I think, on her mind um, and the mind of the members of the committee as, as the hearing went forward. Which cases did she have in mind, do you think, when she made that comment? Well, the first, I know these cases, of course, because I, I teach mm -hmm. them, so I have to know them. Uh, but the first case is called um, Illinois versus Cabela's. It's a, it's a 2005 case involving uh, 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 drug uh, sniffing dogs and whether that's a reliable technique, whether in fact it's even a search, which is a very interesting Fourth Amendment question. When you have a technique that's only supposed to detect contraband, the courts have actually said it's not even a search. And the second case is called Kylo uh, versus U.S., um, and that was the use of a thermal imaging device uh, against the in inside of a home. It was actually Justice Scalia who wrote the opinion for the court in that case and said that a, a warrant would be required because it actually was a search. Uh, both very important cases and, and both clearly on her mind uh, when she was asked that question about the constitutional interpretation. The court is increasingly being asked to apply conventional Fourth Amendment standards to novel situations as it did recently in the Quan case. I know that uh, Epic has been following that one closely. Can you tell us a bit about uh, your thoughts on how it came out? Yeah, we were, we were disappointed in that case. We uh, actually frequently file amicus briefs in the Supreme Court on these emerging privacy and civil liberties issues. We don't file in many cases, but when a privacy case goes to the court, we do take the time uh, to try to give uh, them a, a perspective from technical experts and legal scholars. And we did that in the uh, text messaging case that came out of uh, California uh, from the city of Ontario. A, a lot of people in that case had worried that the court might actually go so far as to say that no public employee had an expectation of privacy in the workplace. I thought that was very unlikely. The court had made pretty clear that there is an expectation of privacy because it's a public workplace. The Fourth Amendment does apply. Uh, but what the court ended up saying was that the search that happened in the case was reasonable. And because the search was reasonable, uh, the court essentially rejected the, the the ruling from the lower court and sided uh, with the city of Ontario, which we thought was too bad. We, we favored Kwan's position, uh, which was essentially that going through someone's text messages on their uh, private text messaging device uh, really is excessive and unnecessary and shouldn't have occurred. Ryan, we've uh, been discussing the hearings this week with potential Justice Kagan. Do you have any particular privacy issues um, that are forefront in your mind as a new Supreme Court justice is being considered? Um, I, I have to agree with uh, the little that I heard here, which is that the, the story is, is the impact, again, of technology 
um, on, on this space, and it has to do with uh, whether or not, under what circumstances do we say that, that um, uh, a citizen has given up their reasonable expectation of privacy. Um, and so where that becomes very important is within the so-called third uh, party doctrine. Um, that, and that's a doctrine that says that if you take your information and you give it to some third party, then arguably you give up uh, the reasonable expectation of privacy. Um, and if you can think about what that might mean for a moment, um, all kinds of cloud computing services, you're purportedly giving your information to a third party. Um, you know, even with the case as uh, the facts of Quan, uh, there was a concern that the idea just that, that Quan had, sort of had committed this information to a third party uh, would give up his reasonable expectation of privacy. Importantly, in that case, that's not what the court said. So the court did not equate simply giving your information with it. Um, but there's a lot of lot of questions about that right now. Um, another one is whether um, uh, there's a, there's a trend in the law that suggests that uh, if a technologies available to the public, largely available to the public, um, then its use by law enforcement does not end up um, implicating reasonable expectation of privacy. So one example is uh, if you fly a helicopter over a house, uh, well, you know, enough people have flown in helicopters, and so if you see something from that helicopter, it's not a technology that, um, that violates your reasonable expectation of privacy. Compared to the, the Kilo case that um, Mark mentioned, where a thermo imaging device is not reasonably available. Now, will that continue to hold up as more and more of these technologies become available to the public quicker and quicker? Um, and so these are the third party doctrine and the reasonable expectation of privacy uh, due to available technology. Those are really important Fourth Amendment issues that I, that I hope the court will, uh, will, will address uh, uh, in the coming years. I must confess to um, almost utter ignorance of what has gone on in the hearings. I haven't watched any of them and have been following the coverage of them only loosely. But my recollection of what has happened in uh, Supreme Court confirmation hearings that I've watched in the past is that you don't learn a whole lot about the nominee, um, that answers are sort of couched in broad, vague terms and keeping the door open to rule however the justice wants to when the time comes. Um, did you, uh, Mark, feel that, that there was any sort of specific information that was gleaned or, or was it more of a general back and forth? It, it was pretty general um, and I think you're right, particularly since the Bork hearings, we haven't had uh, real probing questions of nominees or very detailed answers. Nominees like to say that because an issue might come before them, they don't want to prejudice either party by tipping their hand. At the same time, I think the case has been made that they could say more about previously decided cases and whether they thought they were good decisions or bad decisions. We didn't get either really um, this week, although there were, there were some good exchanges. I'll, I'll say personally, one of the comments I was most fascinated by, and I tweeted about it as I was covering the hearings was uh, Kagan's comment uh, when asked her judicial philosophy. She said uh, several times, it's law all the way down. Well, that's a very interesting phrase because on the one hand, it sounds like she's saying, well, however you look at a problem, you only look at legal sources. Uh, but people who know a little bit about logic and paradox recognize the phrase, it's turtles all the way down, meaning basically it has to be something other than where you started. And, you know, your listeners and viewers can go check Wikipedia f for the reference. So when I heard her use this phrase, it's law all the way down, I was actually wondering if she was being ironic, if she was suggesting that it was something other than law. And that's been a bit of a back discussion taking place uh, during the course of the week. Interesting. Um, one other really interesting thing is sort of tangentially related to the hearings themselves. Actually, I'm wondering if you used it in uh, crafting your letter. Is this resource that was created from the public records from the Clinton administration when Solicitor General Kagan was uh, working in the White House and she had various titles there? Um, but uh, she was someone who worked there for quite some time and her emails are all logged and are now a matter of public record. And over at ZDNet, David Gortz had a post um, highlighting this service or, or site that someone put up called Elena's Inbox. 
at elenasinbox.com, um, which basically takes that database of information and formats it in sort of a traditional webmail kind of interface with a search box at the top and a you know chronological list of emails going down the page. Um, with all these various weighty and much more mundane emails from her term at the White House, things like uh, whether or not she could locate an appropriate mouse pad. And uh, I just uh, wanted to highlight it for people to take a look at. It's kind of an interesting tool. Um, Mark, did you uh, play around with this or see this before? Yeah, I thought it was great, actually. We put together a big web page called uh, Kagan and Privacy. We had gone through, you know, her published uh, statements and some of the things she did as Solicitor General. And as soon as we saw that, all her email, uh, we immediately went searching for what she had to say about privacy. Uh, and when we ended up sending our letter to the committee with some uh, suggested questions, we actually cited some of the things she had said in the email. So for us, it was uh, very useful. And I would also... I think uh, credit uh, the, the Clinton White House and the people involved in the nomination process uh, for making all that material available. It's very frustrating sometimes in Washington when you're trying to get information about uh, people who've made important decisions and, and played critical roles in the White House. There's a lot of secrecy uh, about government decision making. And even though we're a privacy organization, I mean, we favor privacy uh, for individuals and for users, not for government agencies or the White House. Uh, so we were pleased, actually, that they had made that information available. I guess since we don't see anything that's, that's terrible in these uh, email messages, anything that, that really uh, uh, sends up red flags or is, is uh, offensive or something like that, it looks like Elena Kagan realized when she was writing these messages back in the 90s that she didn't have much privacy in what she was saying there in the email system in the, uh, in the White House. So that seems like that could be some kind of meta commentary on, on, on some of this at, at a certain level. Yes, and this whole thing sort of goes back to, to uh, our discussion earlier about things that are in the public and whether you still have some kind of expectation of privacy in them. I don't know if anybody in the Clinton White House would have expected to see their email account laid out as though it were someone's webmail, even though it's obvious and stated to them, I'm sure, for everyone who works at the White House, that everything you do is being logged and scrutinized. Um, Ryan, any thoughts on this? Yeah, I mean, I, I, t t in my um, mind, this links up to some extent um, with the, the Doe v. Reed case before the Supreme Court. Um, and that's the case where uh, there was a, a fight over whether or not um, people who assigned a, a petition for a referendum in Washington um, against a, a gay rights, whether their names could be released. Um, because although I certainly agree with Mark that um, when it comes to government officials, we ought to have transparency. That's the value that should win out, accountability, transparency. And when it comes to citizens and consumers, uh, most of the time we ought to also uh, go the other direction and say that privacy should win out. But what do we do when there's um, something as important as participation in the civic process, something like a petition um, for uh, uh, changes to the law? Um, under those circumstances, should we keep that information a private secret or should we be open and transparent about it? And I think there's a real conflict there, which of course the Supreme Court uh, uh, resolved in favor of transparency uh, in this particular instance. Um, but not without some um, confusion and disagreement among the justices to some extent. Um, so, you know, th I think that plays in it too. I think there may be a gray area in between, you know, private information, purely citizen user, and then, and then really you know, government information. Okay, well, also going on in uh, maybe in a different chamber in the same building over there in D.C. is a pending privacy bill. Uh, that would revamp some of the laws on privacy that we live with today. And uh, it's in committee, and who knows what its fate will be. Maybe we can get some insights on that from our panelists here. But uh, what's happening now is uh, the committee's considering it, and they've received some comments from various entities, including Google and Facebook and others. Um, there, It seems to be... Uh, fairly secretive what some of these comments are or were about the bill. Um, what Google and Facebook have come out and said publicly seems to be that they would like a distinction between information that is collected by sites and different information that is volunteered by people using those sites. So you can um, 
envision how perhaps there would be a different uh, standard for something that you affirmatively posted to your Facebook wall as opposed to the site simply watching your activity. Um, let's see, Mark, have you, uh, have you also, has Epic commented on this pending privacy bill and uh, what are your thoughts on it? Right, well, this sounds like the bill from Congressman Boucher, which uh, attempts to regulate um, online advertising. And of course, people I think are getting a little bit concerned uh, about how intrusive uh, the online advertising uh, profiling has become. I mean, in the old days, we just worried about, you know, the use of cookies to track people as they move from site to site. But now there's been a lot of consolidation in online advertising. And it's really just a few large companies that are building these very intense profiles of users. So I think what Congressman Boucher is trying to do is, uh, you know, put in place some limitations on how much data is collected, how it can be used, and get people a little bit more um, access. Um, I think it's a good approach. I'd probably go quite a bit further than Congressman Boucher has suggested. To me, one of the exciting uh, business models for the internet has always been the possibility of uh, essentially anonymous advertising. In other words, advertising that targets people without knowing their actual identity, uh, which is you know really very easy to do. It's how most of the early advertising companies started. But of course, they wanted to know who they were talking to, and they wanted to go one-on-one, -on -one, and that transform the industry and now we have these very detailed profiles linked to actual identity uh, but I'd like to see if it's possible to sort of push the industry back to giving people the information they want but without having to build these you know enormously detailed uh, profiles of who they are. Ryan does the Consumer Pri Privacy Project have any thoughts or insights on the pending bill from Mr. Boucher? Um. You know, we don't as a, as a group, um, and I can tell you uh, my personal thoughts on it, um, which are that uh, I really like the provision um, that creates a safe harbor for um, uh, tools of access and choice. Um, and so just, just very quickly, um, historically in the online privacy context, the enforcement has all been around the requirement of notice. Um, that is, you have to tell people what you're doing. Um, and, uh, and to some extent, allow them to opt out of things, that is, opt out of tracking. Um, that has not been a successful model. Um, it, you know, privacy policies don't make any sense to anyone. No one reads them. Um, they don't say anything concrete about the practices that are going on. Um, for a long time, uh, you, you see a privacy policy from the website you're on, say, you know, Washington Post, uh, but a lot of the tracking is happening by some third-party ad network that you have no relationship with. So I, I see the, the notice regime as being a, a real failure. Um, and one of the interesting insights that the, that the voucher bill um, introduces uh, is this notion that consumers should be able to access what information a company has about them. That is, they should go to an interface or something and they should look and see this is the information that this company has and I have choices about it. I can delete it, I can change it, correct it, and that sort of thing. Now I wish it weren't a safe harbor in the sense that um, I wish it were an affirmative requirement because I think access and choice are going to be very important uh, going forward. Um, and so I like that element of it, but, uh, uh, but I, you know, I agree with Mark that it could go further in some ways. Evan, any thoughts on uh, pending reining in proposals for online advertisers? Well, I picked up the, uh, the well, as far as advertising goes, the thing that bothers me about the, uh, the, the, the attribute of it here that would allow one to go in and see what information uh, a network has about them, kind of identify the, the uh, contours of their own, of their own profile. Um, you know, that's, that's wonderful from a privacy standpoint, but I wonder about the anti-competitive effect that would have among and between advertising networks if all of this information is going to be uh, open and available to everybody, including other advertising networks, is that going to somehow diminish the effectiveness of, of competition between those networks? Do I know how much of a, of a legitimate concern that is? No, uh, but that does seem like an, an issue to, to flag on this and something to, to consider. The other uh, point I have about this is not in the, the notion of uh, online advertising networks, but in the, the, the observations that, that Facebook and Google had about the bill that where the bill does not seem to make a distinction between data that's collected by the, um, uh, by the provider just in general and information that is voluntarily submitted to the, to the platform. 
in with the intention of, of being shared voluntarily voluntarily and this underscores what we were talking about earlier the question that i had posed um that that mark answered about you know is it isn't there such a fundamental difference in the way that information is is shared um and and gathered and stored these days that there really needs to be a, a serious rethinking about this and this the the fact that that google and facebook made this uh you know drew the absence of this distinction uh to to the attention uh, in to attention in this uh in this uh piece uh really shows how there is a fundamental difference in in the the the, the intention the volition uh the voluntariness in the way that people want information to be shared you know just to to concretize it you know my status update or my check-in information uh or you know photos i post on on a social network are very different than you know my my diagnosis or my credit score or or something like that those those seem to be just so very different and and that's a meaningful distinction yeah i in my mind in order for google and facebook and others who want congress to make such a distinction between you know to treat information that is volunteered as opposed to just passively harvested um I guess in a way that that uh, allows for broader uses of that information. I think that it's incumbent on them to show that the volunteering of that information was given with real informed consent. That that people actually know what they're doing, and that comes down to an issue we talk about a lot on the show: um, how terms of service operate to govern people's online interactions and whether they are comprehensible or not. Um, what, what do you think, Mark? Is, uh, is that a meaningful distinction? And should, should perhaps the uh, commercial providers have to pony up that kind of a showing? Well, Denise, I think the point that you're making is an excellent one. In fact, uh, when we're not doing briefs for the Supreme Court, we're preparing complaints for the Federal Trade Commission, and, and Facebook and Google both have kept us very busy um, over the last year, in part because, as you say, there's a real problem uh, when people's information is, is taken from them, you know, surreptitiously or coercively or, you know, a bit of a bait and switch in the terms of service or the, or the privacy settings. And I think this also suggests that, that drawing this line is a bit of an inducement to the companies to continue with these uh, tactics. Uh, because as long as they can say, well, the information uh, was voluntarily provided and therefore we can use it, uh, they'll keep looking for new tricks to try to get people to turn over data or take people who've provided data for one purpose and try to get them to give it up uh, for another. Uh, and we're really trying to move uh, privacy protection online away from that dynamic. You know, everything we hear from Facebook users, and we hear a lot, um, is that people are just getting very frustrated and worn out uh, by the change in the privacy settings, by the change in the privacy policies. And I think part of the solution in the end will be legislation that says to these companies, listen, it really doesn't matter how you get the data. You're still going to be responsible for its use, and you're still going to have some obligations uh, to the person about whom the data concerns. I think it will actually uh, help solve this other very big problem. So one of the areas where it's, of course, difficult to get a consent that would be considered valid and reasonable is where the rights of children are concerned. And uh, this is going to be our resource of the week. Actually, it's a series of resources. It's uh, everything in the left sidebar at the epic.org site where uh, the good folks at Epic have aggregated posts and topics around things like children's online privacy is the specific one I have in mind and other things like um, cloud computing and social networking privacy and various uh, really interesting topics over there. So be sure to check all those out for more information on all of these issues. Um, but specifically focusing on the Children's Online Privacy Act, COPPA, I see here, Mark, that you testified back in April before Congress uh, about actually the Senate Commerce Committee um, about the failure of that law to keep up with new business practices. And I'm, I'm actually really uh, curious, not um, only because I have a child of my own who is just starting to venture into these waters himself, um, but because of the, the legal uh, construct of contracting with 
children between the ages of 13 and their majority at 18. So between 13 and 17, um, how networks can navigate that sort of murky water. Now under COPPA, they're not allowed to collect data on children under 13 at all. Is that correct? Uh, that's right. Or at least they have to create some new uh, restrictions for kids under 13 relating uh, to parental consent. Uh, what I said in the testimony before the Senate committee, and I wasn't against COP, I mean, I actually helped uh, write the law at the time. I thought it was a reasonable law, although we were urging a higher um, age uh, requirement in the law. As I said, listen, a lot has changed in the last 10 years, and the big change, of course, has been the rise of social networks and the increasing uh, monetization of, of users online, and uh, I thought that was a good reason to try to extend some of the privacy protections uh, now to teenagers, um, those you know between 13 and 18 who really aren't covered under COPPA, uh, but are still subject to a lot of these very intense uh, commercial data collection practices. I was having an interesting back and forth email exchange with one of our listeners whose uh, identity I will keep private because he didn't tell me that he, I could share his name online. Um, but we were, we were talking about the issue of um, how you can have valid terms of service with someone who is not contractually uh, able, legally able to form a contract. Um, and apparently it doesn't slow sites down at all, <laughs> that sort of notion. We have um, here from the Facebook privacy policy a little clause that says we strongly recommend that minors 13 years of age or older ask their parents for permission before sending any information about themselves or to anyone over the internet blah 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 but there's there's nothing there that requires them to get parental consent or otherwise um, do some anything that would seem to me to validate this contract between someone who is underage and a very large commercial entity um, how does that play out under the privacy laws? Mark? Well, that was a, that was a big issue with the implementation uh, of COPPA. You know, do the companies have to ask if someone's under 13? How do you establish their age? How do you establish parental consent? And, and the uh, courts and the FTC, uh, which has played a big role, has, has come up with a couple of, uh, you know, different approaches. Um, so I think there are workable uh, solutions uh, to, to determine age and, and even to obtain consent. Uh, mm -hmm. But the broader issue still uh, with COPPA and with children's online privacy is the massive amount of personal information that's now being gathered on kids through um, social networks. And we really would like to see some limitations and some better some better control. I think people can say, listen, you know, uh, we want kids online. It's, it's providing all sorts of benefit. Um, but you can also say, but there need to be some reasonable limits. Right. Ryan, from the consumer privacy standpoint, um, what do you think about kids and their participation in social networking kind of activities? And and are we doing enough to protect them? Um, well, a couple things. N number one is I think that um, the, the point that your that your um, email, the listener, uh, pointed out is a good one, which is that um, the the fact that terms of service and privacy policies are supposed to somehow be um, agreements or uh, or adequate notice at, at a minimum to users um, is is especially challenged by the notion that there are some categories of users. Of, of people out there who just don't are not in a position to understand or agree to these terms. I think that's a very good point. Um, on the Child Online Privacy Protection Act, particularly, so you have to distinguish between the Child Online Privacy Protection Act, which says that if you're collecting information under the age of 13, you need parental consent, um, or if your website is directed at children, uh, from the Child Online uh, Protection Act. Now that was a law that was that was struck down. Um, and what it was was a content restriction. It, it would not allow children to see certain kinds of, of materials on the internet, and in fact imposed um, restrictions. Uh, you had to give a credit card, I believe, or, or some kind of adult verification means in order to see protected content. Now that was struck down by the Supreme Court as unconstitutional vis-a-vis -vis the First Amendment. So when we change the Child Online Privacy Protection Act in order to change age verification, for instance. Whoops, I think we may have just lost Ryan there. We'll uh, try and get him back. 
and finish that thought. But uh, right now, maybe that's a, a good uh, opportunity for us to um, go to a new sponsor that I'd like to thank for the show. And uh, that is Hover.com. Uh, this show is brought to you by Hover.com. Hover is about making domain registration and service simple. And uh, it's a very near and dear uh, to my heart company because um, I know Elliot Noss, its uh, CEO, uh, personally. He's been a guest on the show before. He is a lawyer. And uh, so just like uh, here at Twit, we have netcasts you love from people you trust. These are domain services you love from uh, people that I do trust, and I think you should too. Um, over the years, domain registration sites have become more and more complicated. You probably know that when you go to register a domain, it seems like it takes 50 clicks just to buy one, and they try and upsell you and upsell you relentlessly. Uh, they barrage you with pages and pages of offers when all you really want to do is buy a domain. Um, so I do use Hover proudly, and in fact, I use it in connection with the show quite a bit. One of the great services they offer um, is something called a personal domain, uh, where a, a, it's a shared domain that's based on your last name. So I can uh, make URLs, short URLs that are great for posting on Twitter, etc., uh, at denise.howell.net. And I do that in connection with the show. We have uh, our Facebook discussion that is reachable that way, denise.howell.net slash FB, um, and various other ways that I use that. Uh, so it comes in incredibly handy. The pricing is very reasonable. They focus on making it easy to register and manage domains and email. Hover was previously called Domains Direct, which has sold domains since 1997, and they know what they are doing. They have a complete help resource area of their website, and it's packed with how-tos and videos. You can go there to learn about managing, forwarding, and transferring domains and email. I, I think in today's day and age, too, domain forwarding is more important than ever before, as we all use third-party hosting services. Um, it, you get something like a squarespace.com domain, for example, that you want to forward to a much more uh, user-friendly and uh, marketing-friendly domain, and Hover can handle all of that for you. And if you should need customer service or help, they have a new no-hold policy for customer service calls Monday through Friday, 9 a.m. to 8 p.m. Eastern. When you call, you get a live person, and they won't put you on hold. Um, so it's very simple domain registration. You can check them out today at twill, T-W-I-L, dot hover, dot com. And when you use the offer code twill, you'll get 10% off whatever service you choose to buy from hover.com. We thank you, thank them so much for their support of twill. Um, so since we're talking about upselling, um, let's go right into our next topic of discussion, which is location-based services and the privacy ramifications that they involved. Um, when I posted something over on our Facebook page about this, um, I, I asked whether people thought that devices and services logging your location data were okay in general, and what constitutes a valid opt-in? Uh, does merely using your device or service or clicking yes on some lengthy, say perhaps 28-page boilerplate uh, privacy policy uh, suffice to give meaningful consent to the gathering and use of that data. And Dwight Spitz over there on Facebook chimed in. It's kind of hard not to think of the movie THX 1138, which uh, I think was a George Lucas production. You can look that one up on Wikipedia if you're not familiar with it. Um, and also, of course, the movie Minority P Report, which we've already mentioned on the show, uh, which seems to be a great big... Um, uh, scary kind of prediction of what could happen to all of our privacy interests as technology rolls inevitably forward. So location services are, are definitely um, out there, ubiquitous. People are checking in right and left. Uh, Mark, what do you think constitutes meaningful consent for such a service? And, and are our laws equipped to handle the kind of very particular and potentially harmful information that someone, something that is tracking you all the time uh, can gather. 
Well, I think the second question is a little easier for me to answer. No, um, I don't <laughs> think our laws um, are equipped uh, to handle some of the new risks um, associated with uh, locational uh, tracking. I don't even think uh, meaningful consent uh, gets to the heart of the problem. Uh, with a lot of privacy, what it comes down to is not so much whether or not you've consented. It's really about how the information about you is, is being used. Um, is it providing you a benefit? Is it creating some new risk? If you're not happy about the arrangement, uh, do you have the opportunity to get out of it? Um, I think those are the, you know, the hard questions associated um, with locational data. The other thing that's so fascinating to me about this topic is that I think most people, you know, have a great experience using things like, uh, you know, GPS services and mapping services that, that help them figure out where they are or how to get somewhere. I think the experience of actually being followed by someone else um, is still something that that is a little unsettling for most people. I mean, even with, you know, Foursquare and Looped and some of the other services that connect you with friends who are close by in physical space, we haven't really quite understood what it might mean for other people who aren't your friends uh, to know where you are in physical space. So it's going to take some time to sort all that out. And while we're sorting it out, I think people need a lot more control um, over their locational data. What do you think about the notion, and I haven't seen this actually happen yet, it seems like most of the location services that I'm familiar with, uh, you mentioned Looped and Foursquare, I guess there's Gowalla. I actually don't use any of them. They seem like they might have a very compelling bit of utility, uh, not just to hook up with your friends, but for the whole advertising component that that has them afloat, that the ability to actually um, gain some uh, benefits from retailers uh, is actually quite an attractive thing. Um, but so, so far I've steered clear of them, uh, but it seems like they, they all so far do have sort of a voluntary component. You're not broadcasting your location unless you jump through several hoops to say, yes, I really wanna tell the world that this is where I am right now. Um, but it seems to me in the future, it would be pretty straightforward to have a device that's just tracking you all the time, that you opt in once when it is activated and it is constantly broadcasting. Um, have you ever, have you come across anything like that, Mark? And uh, do you think that perhaps such things should be squelched before they even can <laughs> come into being? We actually, we actually had a big campaign a couple of years ago when the State Department started putting RFID tags inside the passport. They said it would make the passport locationally aware and they referred to it as the passport program. People were not happy about it at all. And we started sending uh, rolls of aluminum foil to uh, then Secretary <laughs> of State Condoleezza Rice. We actually gave out aluminum foil as part of our protest uh, to kind of encourage people not to let the RFID tag give away their identity. Um, but it's interesting what you said at the beginning, because you know a lot of these new services there's a there's a commercial benefit riding on top of a social benefit. Um, mm -hmm. So maybe there are some circumstances where you do want to disclose your physical location to to someone else, and and an advertiser says, well, now we can use that information, you know, and, and give them a discount on on coffee or or something else as they're going down the street. Um, but I think people are not going to react quite so well to that. I mean, it's very different, for example, on a Facebook page, to see on the side of the page, you know, some advertising that might be related to your topics, and then to have on your cell phone, you know, advertising pop up, you know, based on, on locational data. I think advertisers still have to be careful with this one. And what do you think, Evan? Have you been checking in right and left or are you uh, taking a cautious approach to these? I don't use any location based tools like that, um, mainly just because uh, uh, I still use an old Blackberry that doesn't support any of these this, this stuff very well. Uh, plus, I never go anywhere. I'm always, I'm always in my office working, right? Um, you know, yeah, as the only time you check in elsewhere from your office is when you're vacationing down in Florida and doing 12. Oh, that's right. And I'm, I'm actually in an undisclosed location in the southern part of Indiana today. So I'm trying to uh, you know, get a record for obscure locations to, to do this. I'm in my dad's uh, office at my folks' home. So um, I just checked in, so to speak. Yes. Um, but as far as uh, uh, you know, 
thinking of general principles about how to regulate all of this. I mean, I haven't the foggiest idea of what we should do, but but what I recognize in my mind, and this is very fundamental, and, and you know, with, and I'm embarrassed, you know, having Mark on the line to me be saying such elementary things about about privacy like this, but uh, he's preeminent in, in this in this space. So whatever we would say would sound um, sound pretty fundamental. Um, there really seem to be two classes of, of potential harms from all of this stuff. One is the type of, uh, just, just to stay, say it in shorthand, would be the, the, the risk of, of being harmed by a stalker, you know, knowing where you are, uh, being able to follow you and track you down in, in real life. The other class of harms, or the category of harms, would be that which is uh, more uh, abstractly invasive on someone, having, uh, you know, a monolithic data structure uh, about you out there uh, that can be used uh, to, to market to you and to somehow be turned uh, to do harm uh, against you because whomever it is out there uh, knows uh, so much about you. Now, there are flip sides, good and bad, two aspects uh, to, to both of those things. I mean, the, the opposite of the, the risk of there being a, a stalker is the fact that you can, you can meet up with your, with your friends uh, and, you know, and join up and, and, and uh, find yourself in uh, spatial proximity with those who, who you want to. And that's a, that's a good thing. Um, the, the flip side of the, uh, the, the risk of having this monolithic data structure out there about you uh, the, the, the risk, the, the opposite of the evil of that is the benefit of, of targeted advertising to you that may actually make your uh, con experience as a consumer uh, good and, and valuable and your time being advertised to well spent. So to loop back with what I said, to circle back with what I said, I mean, I have no idea how we should, should regulate it, but it, it seems to me that a fundamental understanding of those principles is important when we're thinking about how information uh, broadcast about uh, an individual out there should be uh, used and what good modes of stewardship over it, uh, uh, what those should look like. Uh, Denise? Yes. Uh, I have a thought about, about that. I, mean, I, I think that on the one hand, um, the benefits of using a lot of these technologies, whether the location or, or whether you're tweeting or whether you're on Facebook and your status update, the benefits are really obvious to consumers. They can see it, right? They, people know where they are, they get the coupon. But the detriments, the potential downsides, the stalking, the databases, et cetera, are not obvious. Um, and that is a real disconnect. Um, you know, in fact, there's even been studies at Carnegie Mellon that show that people really realize what's great about disclosure, but they don't realize what's bad about it. I think our job has to be to realign expectations with actual practice. And sometimes you do that with legal obligations, and other times you do it with better interface design, better notification. Uh, but the goal for me is to get consumers to see the downside, even as they see the upside immediately and viscerally. Yeah, absolutely. And, and as far as the upside being targeted with ads, that's something that the FTC is actually really concerned about and has asked the advertising in industry to take some measures to forestall the FTC getting more involved and taking more proactive measures itself. Evan, you, were, you alluded to this earlier that uh, we're looking at later this summer when there's going to be this new regime uh, from advertisers, at least online, uh, about targeted ads. By the end of the summer, we should be able to see what these advertisers think they know about us, but not exactly why they think they know it. And we can additionally opt out of the targeting that's happening. Um, so what do you think, Mark? Is, is this a sufficient step from the FTC to ask the industry to, um, to be a bit more transparent about what it thinks that it knows about us and, and let us opt out? Yeah, I don't think it's sufficient. I've been urging the FTC to establish uh, some real privacy rules, you know, with legal enforcement uh, for a long time. I don't think self-regulation has worked particularly well uh, for some of the reasons that we, we discussed earlier. But the other point I just wanted to make, agreeing uh, with your other speakers today, is that one of the 
key ideas behind privacy law is that people shouldn't be forced to make these trade-offs. In other words, we should have the benefit of new technology, new commercial platforms, uh, new services uh, without having to give up our privacy. And to me, that's really what a lot of this is about. Um, you know, back in the 1980s, there was certainly a, a well-respected view that said wiretap laws protected people's telephone calls, but not their email. So if you're going to use email, you had to, you know, expect that those communications could be intercepted. And, uh, you know, we got together lawyers and technical experts and, and senators, and they said, well, why does it have to be that way? Why can't we have legal protections for email just like we do for telephone calls? And that's how we got the amendments to the federal wiretap law. And I have a very similar view of a lot of these new issues. I think we want to encourage new technology. We want people to take advantage of them, but we also want uh, privacy uh, protected. And that does mean some new laws. Ryan, what do you think about uh, the notion that advertisers, it should be sufficient for them not to know our actual identities. They should be able to um, manipulate and use the data in an anonymized way. That should, that should be the be all and end all of their ability to target. Do they need to know who we are? Um, I don't think that they need to, to know who we are, but there are two problems with that, with that argument. Number one is a lot of information is surfacing that says that anonymization is really, really hard. Every time Trump, somebody tries to anonymize a database or anonymize search logs, it just doesn't work very well. Um, and in fact, Paul Ohm from the University of Colorado Law School has a really great article called The Failure of Promise of, of, of Anonymization. It doesn't work very well. Number two, there are various harms that can occur that doesn't really matter whether they know who you are or not. So consider the fact that when my wife goes on to Facebook, she sees completely different ads than I do. She sees ads for weight loss and some other things that Facebook thinks is something that my wife will be interested in. Um, and there's a sense in which us having these very different experiences um, and, and people getting different offers, say, for a loan because they're perceived to be in a category that um, is not as, uh, as affluent, so sort of so-called redlining. A lot of uh, sort of bad things can happen to people, unfortunate consequences can occur, that are not tied to the advertiser knowing exactly who you are. So I worry about anonymization as, as the way to deal with this, with this problem. I think that if we were to allow free-for-all that just wasn't connected to the person, we'd still have some harms there. Right. And, and another harm that happens, it's not quite as dire, is just that even if you do opt out of the targeted ads, well, you're still going to get ads and maybe they just won't be as tailored or as tailored as the site thinks that they would be. Um, Evan, any thoughts on uh, the FTC and, and uh, having the industry self-regulate? Not really, but I, the, the harm that I see from all of this is that if I told you what kind of ads you know, pop up for, for my uh, profile. I wouldn't have any friends anymore. You'd just think I was a freak. I don't even want to want to get into that. So that's the real harm. <laughs> exactly. Well, Mark, I'm really glad you brought up the um, the distinction between phones and emails for wiretapping and how when you get into the electronic realm, uh, data begins to take on a different character and we begin to question whether certain data is confidential in one arena and maybe not in another because uh, it it goes right to the heart of this Google Wi-Fi controversy and the harvesting of data from open Wi-Fi networks by the Google trucks as they drive around and do their mapping. Um, of course, there are a lot of lawsuits that have come down the pike uh, against Google over all this. And we're back to this question of, but wait a minute, it's public data. People one way or another did not encrypt their network and are broadcasting their stuff out there. Um, now, that, that may be the case, but there's a good article by um, Christopher Dawson over at ZDNet where he goes into the technicalities of exactly how Google chose to uh, collect certain data from unencrypted networks versus um, ignoring the data from encrypted networks. And uh, the, the upshot of it is that uh, this was actually you know, not just an incidental thing that happened when the trucks were driving around. It wasn't just, whoops, where did all this data come from? It was something that was, seems to have been consciously targeted and uh, 
hauled in. Um, so even though this data is public, Mark, is there a privacy interest here? Well, let me say, first of all, that when we're not doing our Supreme Court briefs and our FTC complaints, we're updating our map on the investigations of Google Street View. Mm -hmm. And if you search for privacy in Street View, I think it's the uh, epic page that will come up first. Um, it's one of the most interesting projects uh, we've pursued uh, precisely because there are so many uh, complaints that have been brought, so many uh, different legal theories. Uh, but the thing I'd say at the beginning is I don't think this data was public in any meaningful sense. I don't think that anyone who uses uh, a Wi-Fi router, whether they secure it or not, is actually publishing uh, the information that they're uh, uh, sending from their uh, Wi-Fi router uh, as we think of, of the notion of, of being public. Um, I think it can be incidental to the use of the device, and there are certainly circumstances where people might choose to leave a router available because they want to give others open Wi-Fi access. Um, but this is something very, very different that's going on here. Um, keep in mind also that apart from the transmission data that, that Google claims they uh, uh, in accidentally intercepted, they were clearly intending to download and store all the device data, the MAC ID address, the SSID, the location, and everything else. They were building a giant uh, map of, of uh, Wi-Fi spots around the world, and they were very secretive about it. Um, so I think this is a very big deal. I don't think Google uh, really by any stretch uh, can say that this was just publicly available. What do you think, Ryan? Um, well, I, I think a couple things. Uh, number one, uh, I think that one of the real dangers here is the precedent this might set for law enforcement. Okay, so it's one thing for a company to go around and you know may, maybe accidentally pick up stuff. It's quite different for the law enforcement to go around using the same technology and look at all of our, our Wi-Fi data and then claim that it's publicly available and so that they don't need... Um, uh, adequate process, at least under the Constitution. So that's my my real main concern here. I mean, if a company collects information, discovers that they did it, and then destroyed it, we can have conversations about what's wrong about that. But I'm really concerned that the government will use this technique, and I'm also concerned that the government will compel Google to turn over information uh, to the government about what exactly it got from citizens. That's what really bothers me about the the mistake here, is that it collected a bunch of information, and now various governments are asking for it. Um, and so, yeah, I, I, I agree that nobody thinks of it as, as, uh, as being public. Uh, by the way, I also agree with that statement. That's certainly true. I mean, we wouldn't, um, we wouldn't say that you thought that people could go in your house just because you left the door open. Yeah, that's a great analogy, even though it's not very secure. Um, Evan, we it had a, a viewer email question from Jeff Rash that relates to this topic. And I wanted to uh, toss it at you and see if you know the answer, um, because I think it's kind of a murky area and I'm not sure I do. And uh, it's whether it's illegal to connect to an open Wi-Fi access point without express permission from the owner. And uh, you know, could there actually be criminal liability for Google uh, for having done this? What do you think? Uh I wrote an article that touched on this you know, a couple of years ago, and um, I, I've I haven't you know researched it since then, but I've seen some stories come up from time to time. This question of of whether or not there's there's any liability for that, and um, what I do know is that there have been some criminal indictments. I don't know the status of those, but you know the theory is is conversion, you know, stealing something uh, from from someone, and that seems to be the the, the biggest risk, you know, on the criminal side of things here, um, uh, you know, is it is it the, the theft of something or is it somehow trespass to, to, to that in, in a criminal sense? And there would be something closely analogous on the civil side. Uh, this obviously is not a very hotly litigated area. Uh, I, don't, I don't know of any civil suits that have been, been brought over this, but the best kinds of theories in my mind would be if I were constrained to you know, file a, a civil complaint on behalf of, of someone who, um, you know, felt that their wife or knew that their Wi-Fi had been accessed without their authorization. Uh, it, it, there might be some kind of, um, you know, Intel versus Hamidi type of uh, 
Oh, is it is it Hamidi? Was that his name? I get that confused mm-hmm. with the, the Supreme Court case with the trespass uh, to chattels. Yeah, the trespass to chattels, uh, that whole notion. I suppose there could also be some stuff under the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act if there's actually some kind of diminution of the system. You know, it would seem to be access to a protected computer. I guess maybe maybe not. You know, there's there's a specific definition of computer in the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, and I don't know if the if a wireless router would would fall under that. But uh, th- those seem to be the obvious. Uh, ways to to you know pursue this the the avenues to to walk down and at least look at the look at the scenery while you're walking down those avenues well and that's of course what google thinks it's doing as it's driving around in its uh in its google mapping trucks just looking at the scenery that anybody could see um yes. other uh, ways in which uh, public data can show up in unusual or unexpected ways are all of the search engines that are out there now that are people search oriented. And I just wondered quickly uh, what Ryan and Mark think about those that will take things that are admittedly public records. And and Evan, you were talking about how in the olden days it used to be you would go down to the courthouse and dig through dusty files to find the deed that related to a house or what have you. Mm -hmm. And now all of that is being aggregated by search engines that are um, akin to what, you know, private investigators, I guess, have traditionally used. They cost lots of money and you would have to go out and hire one of them and pay their expenses and in a Sam Spade sort of way to get that data. And now for a lot less money, um, although they do seem to be for pay services in general, if you want to really get into the detail, um, you could find out, you know, if you know someone's name, you can find out where they live. You can find out the value of their home. You can find out their date of birth. You can find out all kinds of things um, about them through something that's really as tri- trivially easy as a Google search. Um, Ryan, is is this something that uh, that needs to be clamped down on, or is it something that we all just need to get used to living with? Um, I think we should clamp down on it. I, I want to point out a couple things. It's- the, the Federal Trade Commission has already gone after um, those sort of pri- you know, website private eyes. Um, I think AccuSearch is one of them. There's an FTC complaint um, and, and a later follow-up case where the, the, um, uh, the FTC has actually gone after a group because they used, uh, they were sort of as a warehouse for people to do things like pretexting, which is where you pretend to be some uh, account holder and then get information like telephone information. Oops, we've been having trouble with uh, Ryan's Skype. I think he may have just dropped out again. Mark, what's your thought on that one? Well, Ryan was making a good point. That was actually a complaint that we had brought to the FTC um, several years ago when we learned that um, companies were offering online the sale of detailed call histories of, of telephone customers. And the way they were able to get that information was by calling up the telephone company and pretending to be the customer and the company, you know, would fax or email last month's billing statement to the person who said I had some questions about my bill, and that person would turn around and sell the data um, online, uh, which was clearly uh, a very bad practice. And eventually, the FTC shut it down. Um, but certainly, a lot more information is is today publicly available. We don't think that's generally speaking a, a bad thing. A lot of uh, information should be publicly available. Uh, but I think the privacy issues start to arise around the information information that people do generally try to keep private. Um, it's always very interesting to me, for example, you know, looking on Facebook, I've got lots and lots of friends. I've never seen anybody uh, post their social security number or checking account number or anything that was particularly, you know, personal like that or would create a risk of identity theft. I think most people, even on social networks, understand that there's some information uh, that you just don't want to make publicly available. Right. Right. Um, Another area in which public information can crop up in unexpected ways is in the insurance arena. And there's a really wonderful article by Jeremiah Ouyang, if I'm saying his name properly, regarding social data and insurance. Um, And I wanted to run this by our privacy gurus. Uh, The the crux of the article is that uh, there's a lot that's out there about you that you have voluntarily placed, perhaps, online. Um, in ways that uh, is not limited to your sphere of friends, but is out there and and could be gathered by someone anxious to sleuth up information about you. Um, And that all of that kind of information could be very valuable to insurance companies 
auto insurance, health insurance, as they're trying to set rates. And uh, I'm wondering um, if you think that there's a way of regulating that, or again, if this is just something that uh, we will need to learn to live with as we put more and more of our lives online. Mark, do you think that insurance companies can uh, go out and take a look at, you know, whether you're checking in at Trader Joe's or Carl's Jr. and make some judgments about your health habits based on that kind of decision? Well, I want to say I hope not, but, um, you know, I don't know for certain what they're capable of doing, uh, but I certainly think the activity can be regulated. And this is another point about privacy that sometimes, you know, people don't see immediately. They think, well, the information is publicly available and companies use that information. They make determinations about people based on that information. But I think it's completely reasonable uh, to have regulations that limit uh, the kinds of information that companies can use when they make uh, determinations about people. I mean, to take a very obvious one, you know, we wouldn't like it if a company was using race as, as a factor uh, when making a decision about someone. Now, of course, you know, race information is pretty easy to obtain, uh, but the fact that it's easy to obtain doesn't answer the question of whether it can be used uh, by a company in an, in an employment decision or a housing decision. I think we'd say, well, that's, you know, really an unfair type of discrimination. And a lot of our modern privacy laws, you know, recognize this principle. Congress passed a law a couple of years ago called the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act. And it basically said to employers, you know, as with race information, you shouldn't use a person's uh, genetic information in, in hiring and promotion decisions. Yes, uh, you can get access to it. It may not be that difficult to locate, but that really doesn't answer the question as to whether or not you have the right to use it. Right. Um, Ryan, I think uh, this actually plays really well into some of your field of research because in addition to all the data that we put out there about ourselves, of course, as we mentioned at the beginning of the show, the various devices and mechanisms in our lives are becoming more self-aware and logging data, such as things like robotic technologies that might come around and pilot our cars. And uh, much to the delight of Evan and I, who love this topic to death, you are an expert on robotics and the law. Um, what do you think about this in the context of uh, insurance and having your car check in on you? Are you there, Ryan? We may have lost him again. Um, Evan, since since you're, oh no, there you are. Okay, here, there I am. I'm so sorry about my connection. I don't know what's going on here. That's all right. Um, so, I mean, that's a great question. Uh, as um, vehicles become more autonomous and have autonomous features, that is to say, drive themselves, correct the lane that they're in, and other things like that, you know, avoid accidents, they're going to have to communicate with other vehicles. Um, and they're going to have to record ever more amounts of, uh, a greater amounts of data. And so what ends up happening is that that information can be repurposed, much the same way as when we want an energy efficient grid, we have to collect a lot of information about people's usage habits. It's a good thing. Um, so do we get all that information and can use it for another purpose like law enforcement or targeting advertising. Um, so, you know, vehicles are, are a starting place, but also we're going to see a lot of surveillance, uh, I think, in, in coming years uh, by robotic um, uh, drones and the like, in, which are being used not just in the military context, but now increasingly on our borders and, and ever increasingly more domestically. So there's a lot of interesting intersections on, on robotics um, and privacy. And I wrote a book chapter for a forthcoming book uh, on robo, robo ethics from MIT Press, and it's up on SSRN. If people want to know more about the intersection of robotics and, and privacy, robo ethics, I love it. So, mm -hmm. as I've read through your stuff, you seem to be um, the guy. And, and please, I'm saying this tug in cheek. I don't mean to really paint you as the guy who's going to lead to the um, destruction of human civilization as we know it. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> you, you do. I'm a booster. Um, it's true. It's true. Yes, yeah. You you do seem to want uh, protections in place for folks who are developing robotic technologies, um, the same way as uh, we're used to seeing in place for third-party sites that gather information such as Google and, and host, um, host online transactions, I guess is what I'm looking for, that uh, people should be able to interact to some extent with their robots without necessarily triggering 
liability on the part of the manufacturer. Do you want to sketch out for us how that would work? Yeah, sure. So, uh, you know, any, any Sarah Connor or John Connors out there, I'm, I'm not the person to go after as I have nothing to, nothing to do with this. But, but I am worried uh, that the robotics industry um, will be stopped in its tracks uh, because someone will use a robot in a certain way or will program it and it'll go wrong and hurt somebody or, or, or some property. Um, and so my concern is just as with in, in general aviation when we're making small planes, to some extent with guns and to some extent on the Internet with respect to content, um, the lawsuits are always possible against the people that make these platforms. So in the Internet context, uh, you know, there's a very big concern that you'd be able to sue, uh, say, a social network for what users do on it. And uh, it's this great open communications platform, but if people do certain things with, that, with those platforms, then you might be able to sue the, uh, plat the website itself. But, of course, the Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act immunizes websites for what users do. Similarly, uh, and you can say whatever you want about the gun industry, but similarly with the gun industry, so many people were suing the manufacturers of guns for what users were doing with them uh, that they had to pass a law. Uh, accidents were happening in the general aviation context, um, and it actually bankrupted that industry until they passed the General Aviation Rehabilitation Act. Um, I am similarly want uh, robots to be open platforms that anybody can use, anybody can program, that can where the People who are the consumers determine all the interesting, innovative uses uh, with robotics. Um, one, one example is, uh, for instance, with the Roomba. So people were hacking the Roomba so much. That's that little vacuum cleaner that goes around and cleans up. Uh, they were hacking it so much that, that, um, uh, that, that its manufacturer got the picture and created this uh, iCree, which is a little platform, and it came with a manual called iHack, that told you all the different ways you could modify your, your Roomba platform to make it do things. I'm worried that it's going to actually run into somebody, that it's going to um, harm somebody, and that they're going to go after the folks with the deep pockets of the manufacturers. And so it's true. I've been arguing for uh, limited immunity for... Oh, no. <laughs> ah, we lost Ryan again. Just when I was going to let Evan... Uh ask, no doubt, his many burning questions about oh, robotics yeah. and the law. Um, you, you know, I, we'll, I suggest sometime we have Ryan back and just have a whole episode about robots. Yeah. That would just be the, the bee's knees. We're, we're going to do that for sure. Um, yes. So, especially because uh, his connection has been so spotty on this particular and we're episode. Not even, we're not even talking about network neutrality. I've noticed the pattern that the only time we have throttling issues is when we're talking about, you know, <laughs> we're lambasting the FCC. <laughs> Yes. Well, it must be Skynet right. <laughs> coming coming into play this particular time. Um, all right. Well, uh, with with that, uh, I do, I'll, I'll give our tip of the week and get out of here. Our tip of the week is a great one from Venkat Balasubramani over um, on Eric Goldman's blog, the Technology and Marketing Law blog. Uh, it's, it's called Steps to Internet Proof Your Cease and Desist Letter. Um, so please do go check that out. This is in the wake, of course, of uh, last week's tip of the week, which was make sure that if you're going to send a cease and desist letter about a product, make sure that it actually does exist. And this was uh, in reference to the Think Geek Unicorn Meat uh, that was offered at uh, April Fool's Day. So um, this is a great bunch of common sense principles for folks who do uh, have to craft cease and desist letters and send them out um, and and can help make, help avoid the Streisand effect, help avoid uh, sites such as Think Geek having an absolute field day with your 12 page epistle. Um, so do go, go check that out and thank you Venkat for the public service of offering those guidelines. And thank you so much, Mark, for joining us. We know that your schedule is incredibly busy. I am honored and thrilled that you could join us this week and talk about all these very critical issues. Well, it's a great program. Thank you for the opportunity to participate. Our pleasure. And Evan, thank you so much for coming back on the show. Oh, before I uh, say a final goodbye to Mark there, um, Mark, I know that um, we've been mentioning epic.org throughout uh, the show, but where can folks follow you on Twitter as well? I'm on Privacy 140, and I'm um, giving regular updates on privacy issues in Washington. That's right, and you check, you check in there from things like congressional, judicial confirmation hearings, et cetera. So um, that is a great place to uh, check in with Mark and 
keep up to date on the cutting edge privacy developments in Washington. So thanks so much, Mark. Hope to talk to you again. Evan, always yes. a pleasure to have you on the show. Folks Same should, here. Uh, should go check out Evan at uh, internetcases.com, at internetcases on Twitter. Any final thoughts before we go? Well, happy uh, 4th of July. It's going to be a great yes. uh, weekend uh, here. So hope the same for you all. Yes. Happy Independence Day all and uh, happy independently valid privacy. Let's uh, not let that issue go off the front burner um, as all of our technologies continue to watch what we're doing at all times. Thanks, everyone. Oh, and yay, Ryan's back with us. Uh, do you want to say goodbye to Ryan yeah, Callow? Ryan, so well, while you were off, Evan and I uh, decided we definitely want to have you back and do a whole show on robotics law if you are um, available and willing. That'd be great, and I'll do it from another connection. I don't know what's going on today, but, uh, but thanks so much. If people want to hear more about robotics and privacy, I'm also at uh, RCALO um, over on Twitter. So thanks so much for the opportunity. I appreciate it. Fantastic. And thanks for all your good work, work up at Stanford. Thanks. All right, folks. We'll see you next time here on Twill.